years now uh, to, um, to measuring our greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, thinking about the business case, Climate Smart um, has we, we feel that there's a very strong business case for this and that we, that we um, need to be aware of it and we need to get really good at articulating it. Um, especially if you're in a company where uh, maybe you don't have buy-in all the way up and down, down the chain, this can be very helpful um, to articulate. And also when we're looking at um, different reduction strategies, but just that this is smart business, it's good business practice, as well as, as something that we need to be doing um, to achieve the global absolute reductions in emissions that, that we know are necessary. Um, so over in the like, top left, uh, those graphs just represent the opportunity to, um, to reduce costs and reduce our exposure to things like volatile energy prices. Um, and then, of course, brand lift and competitive advantage. Uh, you guys are leaders being in this room and the companies that we've worked with so far. Really, um, still, there aren't that many businesses um, doing a rigorous job of measuring the, and managing their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the market is, is starting to, to, to ask for it in many sectors. And uh, so there's, there's benefit to be gained. And I've got some examples I can share with you in just a minute. Um, and the opportunity as we do that to see places for new markets, new products, changing how we deliver our goods and services as we, as we also focus on, on ways to reduce our emissions. Um, and then finally, um, recruiting and retaining employees. And we're hearing that um, from a number of different sectors. Uh, that a new prospective employees, they want to work for an organization that aligns with their values. And uh, particularly in tourism, and I'm curious to hear from you if you're finding that as well, but retaining, retaining employees over time, uh, they're seeing, um, they're seeing some, some results there. So on the sort of cost reduction side, we have West Coast Air. Um, is that who you flew with? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is one of our clients. And they worked with um, NAV Canada or Transport Canada, uh, started to fly at a slightly higher level. Um, and reduced drag, uh, also rerouted, just adjusted their route a little bit, but looked really closely at efficiencies, worked really hard on their load, and um, reduced their fuel consumption and their <coughs> costs by about 12% over, over one year. Um, on the sort of branding competitive advantage, Salt Spring Coffee, which I think now is out here in Ontario, um, they, they're com they've been committed to sustainability and fair trade and organic coffee, and and um, achieving carbon neutrality for a while. They decided, so the whole operation is carbon neutral. So they've measured, they've done a bunch to reduce, they've purchased carbon offsets uh, to sort of cover the, their remaining emissions um, and have sort of claimed carbon neutrality. But they decided that branding-wise, they were going to brand one coffee blend as carbon cool and sort of as a way to, to elevate their work in the marketplace. And this is their logo that they developed. And so it's been interesting to watch how they communicate about that on their website, on their packaging, etc. cetera. Um, new goods and services. <clears throat> so these carbon sink guys, just, uh, just last Christmas locally in Vancouver, they started, they rented basically live trees. So customers would pay, I think it was started at $25 and then got more expensive depending on the size of the tree. You would get the tree in a pot for a couple of weeks, they would come pick it up and the trees would wind up in restoration projects. Um, and then a percentage of their, their profits actually goes to a local conservation area. Um, carbon sink, so a little bit of, diff you know, a, bit of a different take. They, they had one um, story on CBC and they were sold out. Done. So clearly there's a market for it. Um, and then frog box, these guys, they're just using reusable plastic uh, moving boxes. So rather than buying or uh, what I always do is, uh, is go to the liquor store or the grocery store and get the, the cardboard boxes. If you're doing a bigger move, you can rent the, the boxes. They drop them off. They pick them up a little bit later and reuse them. And they looked really closely into sort of the life cycle of creating a plastic box and how many times it gets used versus cardboard. And... Uh, um, learned that this is a sort of much preferable approach uh, from an environmental perspective. So, two, two new ways of, of providing a service. I might just add, has people heard of the Carbon Disclosure Project? So, recently they just surveyed their members. So, this was started by a bunch of investors saying, this is a liability that needs to be disclosed. So, this is right before the recent ruling with the SEC saying, yes, you need to start disclosing this. So they, they surveyed their members and 56% said that they would 
deselect suppliers now that don't meet their carbon management criteria. They said 6% are currently doing that, but 56% they will be planning to do that. So that's a whole new market signal around suppliers that we haven't seen before. So that's another business case. Um, employee recruitment and retention. Uh, small company, couple, couple coffee shops. Um, he, his employees really drove his interest in sustainability. It, they started to ask questions, and he responded to it. And then um, I saw, I sort of felt good about it, and also saw some bottom line um, uh, benefits pretty immediately. Um, but but talked about, you know, the average barista is in a coffee shop for about four months. So the, the effort in training and quality control and putting systems in place. It's, a, it's an issue with coffee shop owners to that, that turnover. And um, he's averaging 18 months with his employees, and they're still driving things. He's still really listening to them and his customers when he's making decisions. And they're doing a whole bunch of interesting stuff around uh, diverting from the landfill, doing a lot of waste diversion, um, consolidating deliveries, uh, think, rethinking where they're sourcing some of their baked goods from, et cetera. So they're really sort of digging in. The more, they, the more benefit they see, the more they, more they take on. Um, I have a great story back to kind of competitive advantage and um, what the market is asking for. A water company that, that we've worked with, um, so some middle managers in the BC office were really keen on this. Came through the Climate Smart program, were doing their, you know, did their inventory, but had to really arm wrestle uh, the accounting department, which was out here in Ontario. And then one of their biggest clients, a very large financial institution, uh, called them and said, hey, we're doing our own greenhouse gas inventory and we're starting to think about our carbon emissions and we're starting to look at our supply chain. What are you guys doing? And uh, so senior management could turn to the Vancouver guys and say, well, what, what are we doing? And they, said, they could say, actually, we've measured and this is what we've come up with. And so all of a sudden they had a lot of buy-in from the top. And I really like that story because they were able to respond to, to a market that is shifting that way. So emitters of at facilities, facilities that emit 25,000 tons. I'm kind of looking at some of the, the folks who are working more here um, to make sure I've got the right, the right information. But when I was doing a little bit of research, if you're emitting more than 25,000 tons, and these are direct emissions, and we'll get into that, but where you're burning fossil fuels, where you're combusting fossil fuels, you're required to report um, to, the, to the province of Ontario. And that, that actually relates to um, the cap and trade system that's going to come online as part of, of Western Climate Initiative. Um, and so it's, it's the beginning of starting to understand what, what is our baseline, what are we working with here with the large emitters. So as part of the cap and trade system that I mentioned as part of Western Climate Initiative, it's the 25,000 um, ton threshold at which entities will begin to be regulated. What is a greenhouse gas management strategy or program? Um, and really, it rests on this idea of the sort of mantra, if you will, of measuring, reducing, and then perhaps offsetting. So the most important thing we do is we need to understand where we are. We need to do um, a, a rigorous greenhouse gas inventory. Um, and that tells us where we're at. We understand um, you know, where, our, where our emission sources is, are, how much, um, and what gets measured tends to get managed, is often what we say. And so. Um, the first step is, is looking at, at where it's coming from, and we it, often you have some aha moments where you've been considered what the main sources will be, or there are small surprises, and you can see opportunities to reduce. Next step is actually to develop a plan to reduce, um, a reduction plan. Setting a reduction target um, is a great thing to do. It's uh, measurable, obviously. Uh, it sets some accountability but internally, um, as much as as much as publicly. It doesn't necessarily have to be public. Public. Um, but it, it holds us to something. If we are communicating publicly, it's a helpful, it's a helpful tool as well. Um, organizationally, it's something to rally around. Um, and of course, we're implementing those plans and, and evaluating them as we go. Um, and once we've measured and reduced, you know, set a plan to reduce as much as we can in-house. And that, that's really important. I see organizations go from measure straight to offset um, and call themselves carbon neutral and call it good. But that, that's not best practice. Uh, at all, and, and often that's uh, some of the skepticism we hear about <coughs> offsets, right, is this idea, this kind of paying to pollute or, you know, an indulgence idea. But So the idea is we measure, we reduce as much as we possibly can, and then we consider purchasing um, carbon offsets, at, which, which basically are reductions that have happened somewhere else, and we're buying the credit for that to enable, um, enable us to say that we're, we're carbon neutral. An example might be 
uh, and often you go through an offset provider that is uh, purchasing the credits uh, from a number of different projects. Uh, there could be a, um, a wind generation project um, that wouldn't have happened, and this is sort of getting a little bit beyond the scope of the, of the, of the workshop, but one of the key criteria, what makes an offset an offset, is it, it's a reduction project that wouldn't have happened without the investment of your, your offset funds. So it's additional. The project wouldn't have been able to happen unless someone was willing to say, hey, I'm going to buy that carbon credit from you, and you can use the money I give you to make it happen. So it's, it's uh, beyond business as usual. And the thing I wanted to highlight, actually, is the central part, that it's an ongoing process. If you haven't measured your greenhouse gas emissions yet, your first step will do to be to do your first inventory and set a baseline. Um, against which you will, you will um, measure, ideally every year, best practice is that it's an annual process. And, and um, I think of our work and your work here as early adopters, really this, I hope it's the beginning of, this becomes um, common business practice. It's another metric um, that we're tracking in our business. And certainly as regulation comes down, um, increasingly we will be required to, depending on the size of your, your organization and, and your emissions. But I uh, wanted to just highlight this idea that it's an ongoing process that we're, you know, evaluating, measuring again, understanding our progress toward our goals. Um, if you're getting going on your first, uh, your first stab at measuring your greenhouse gas emissions, what do you, what do you need to ex succeed? What's important to have in place? Not pretty critical is support from owners and upper management. Um, and we can talk a little bit later about some ideas around getting that support if you don't have it. Certainly d diving into the business case and seeing how it can benefit your organization is, is uh, one of the strongest arguments to make. But uh, it's, imp it's important to have some, some champions at the upper levels to um, commit to a, car to a reduction target, um, to help get buy-in from the accounting department if you don't have it, just to, to help internally people understand that it's, a, it's an organization-wide effort. Um, and allocation of resources, and it depends, um, and we'll get into this a little bit later, also Jennifer talking about uh, different options and, and how we put time. Certainly it takes some organizational time, some human resources. If you're doing it um, in-house uh, on your own, it'll take more time, uh, clearly, than um, if you're working with a consultant to come in and, and do the work uh, with you. And then when you get to, um, get to the place where you're looking at how to reduce emissions, depending on what you decide, there may be capital. Um, needed to, to invest in new technology, etc. Communication is key, and this sort of ties back up to the first point, but both internal and, and external if you want to communicate and tell the story about what you're doing, but helping the whole organization understand what your goals are and where you're trying to go um, is pretty key, so that you get cooperation and that people understand and also can communicate out about that so the whole organization understands that you're committed to it. And external, um, again, there's, there can be brand lift, competitive advantage, um, positioning in the marketplace. Also, um, this is a field everybody's learning all the time. And so we really encourage the companies that we work to tell some of the stories because they're sharing knowledge as well and being examples for people who are starting to do it. And then commitment. Uh, because the first time we do our greenhouse gas emissions inventory, we tend to be, and we'll get into it again with this as we dive in, but uh, we're, we're often digging up information that's never been dig dug up in quite this format before. Um, so the first time you do it, take some commitment and some perseverance, and you can set, and it's an, also an opportunity to put systems in place so that the next year you do it, it's much easier to figure out what your emissions were associated with your business travel, for example. Even Ecotrust Canada, small NGO, it was, um, it was no mean feat the first time we, we tried to figure out who had gone where uh, looking back over a year. And I know our admin ops person, she can't stand the taxis. She can't stand all my taxi receipts and this and that. Yeah. So commitment uh, and understanding that doing it the first time will take some effort, for sure. This is kind of our last section and getting into greenhouse gas accounting protocols and principles. So there are standards out there now. Um, the, the main one, and the one that we teach to, is the, the greenhouse gas protocol, the, account, the corporate accounting and reporting standard. It was developed by the World Resources Institute and um, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and with input from lots and lots of stakeholders, industry, uh, government, nonprofit, 
Uh, the, first, um, the first version came out in 2001. It was updated in 2004. Um, you can find that online if you, if you Google GHG protocol. Uh, you can find that in lots of other resources. They also um, publish emission factors and some tools. Uh, the tools are US focused, so just a word of warning if you're, if you're looking at those. Um, and, uh, and it's being used and referred to all over, all over the world. It's what we teach too. There's a, you know, I've thrown up a few examples of larger organizations that are, um, that are using it, but it's really, it's really the first and, and foremost uh, standard out there. Um, and then uh, ISO, the International Standard Organization, also published um, 14,064 uh, part one is, um, is their standard that uh, gives guidance on organizational greenhouse gas inventories. It, it refers to the greenhouse gas protocol quite a bit. And the two organizations came out a few years ago and said they're combat compatible and we sort of jointly promote each other. But if you're an organization that's all already kind of invested in ISO, this is something good to know. Um, and they're out there. They've also come out with guidance around um, the development of carbon offset projects. Uh, reduction projects and validation and verification. So they're getting into this space as well, um, uh, but again, compatible with, uh, with the greenhouse gas protocol. For somebody just learning it, I find the, the protocol, the GHG protocol, more helpful because they give more guidance and examples and it's just written. Um, it, it's, there's more, more depth and, um, and help there. The ISO um, the standard is very much just very cut and dry with, with not so much uh, supporting material. Protocol um, and its guidance, its, its standards are based on these on these principles. Um, and uh, a while ago, one of uh, one of the guys in our in our um, workshops came up with the the acronym TRAC. Uh, uh, I was giving um, a workshop, and I said off the top of my head, oh, "We need an acronym for that." And he sat there and then suddenly spat out TRAC, which seems to work. But um, here they are in the order given in the in the protocol. Um, and they're, they're useful to return to with, you know, as, you, as you build your greenhouse gas inventory and as you think about reporting, uh, reporting out um, relevance. So including in your inventory um, the emission sources that are material to your business, you know, if, they're, if you think they're a significant source, and also if they're important to your stakeholders and, and, the, um, and the decision makers who are going to be using the report. So thinking about, um, thinking about that completeness you know, our effort to, once we've drawn our boundary, and we'll get into that after the break, including and gathering the data for, all, for all, those, all those sources. So committing to doing that as much as possible. And there are places, and we'll talk about that, where we might bump up into the, into the difficulty of gathering, <coughs> making some decisions around there. Consistency in our methodology, how we're calculating or how we're, how we're gathering, documenting that well. Um, and being consistent so that we can make comparisons year over year, and documenting when we're changing methodology, um, if we're if we're making some assumptions, what are they? Um, transparency throughout. So again, um, really good documentation. And if it come when you come to reporting out about your emissions, being clear about what you've included in your inventory, what you've excluded, and why. And um, transparency internally, maybe even more importantly, you might not be the person next year who's in charge of this. Or maybe you will be, but it's been a whole year. And so good documentation is, is key and being really clear, uh, both internally and externally around what you've done and how you've done it. Um, and accuracy, the um, obvious, but uh, you know, giving your best effort to gather real, accurate data, um, that's uh, really all there is to it, but a, a commitment to being as accurate as possible. So those are the, those are the important principles, and really it, it, that's what the whole protocol is, is built on, and then it gives some more, uh, more guidance.